Hey, my name is Harold Zwart. Uh, I'm doing the Monday Morning Critic. Happy to be here. Thank you. Harold, um, I have to believe, and from looking at your, your career and your life, that your career has taken you all over the globe. And I, I have to believe that you view that as a perk as well, right? You've seen so much of the world. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, commercials. Uh, not only features, but commercials do that right. to you. So I'm... Uh, I've ended up in, uh, yeah, most uh, all over the world shooting commercials. And yes, how, how do you fun. like, yeah, how do you like shooting commercials? I, I love it. I mean, that is our bread and butter in, the, in our business. Uh, it allows you time to, to uh, get the right next movie uh, because that's always the toughest choice is what's going to be your next movie. Um, and then while you're waiting for that, you, you do commercials and I've been lucky to have a career where I have, uh, I'm covering most markets in the world. So I, I go all over and, uh, you know, not only do I do commercials for most of the different markets in the world, but we shoot all over the world too. So, um, it's also a great way to stay uh, on top of any new technology and, uh, uh, you know, you have, always a great uh, crew everywhere, wherever you go. And everybody's worked with everybody else. So there's like, you're learning from everybody. Yeah. Um, no, I really enjoy it. Uh, how long is it? How long is a typical commercial shoot? I mean, I've, I've had other directors on the podcast and, and I never really thought to ask. Right. I, and I get the, you know, why do people do commercials, but like what, how long is a typical shoot? It could be anything. Um, from one day to five days uh five yeah. days is generally a big commercial uh and if you have really good teams all over you know like i have a a team in barcelona i have a team in dubai i have a team in in london and germany and la and if if these guys are good then you don't necessarily have to show up until maybe two days before the shoot so you, you come straight off the plane do a tech recce to a quick wardrobe uh, thing and then you start shooting and then uh, the tradition is that you you now edit uh, either you do your first edit just the, the weekend of your shoot and then you leave a day or two after you shoot so i can be it could take me a week to do a, a pretty big commercial and then that way i can also stack them so sometimes i have two commercials in a month Gotcha. Yeah, that, that that would make sense. And and creatively, is is it like a cinema or television in the sense that you have control, or do they pay? Hey, Harold, we want you to come in here. This is what we want. Um, just shoot it. Or do you say, you know what? I have an idea how this should unfold. This is what I'm thinking. How do commercials work in that regard? Are they similar to movies in that way? Uh, they're not similar to movies. Uh, I mean, they're they're a totally different beast, uh, and it all. Every commercial is as different as uh, there's no set rule, but uh, a lot of times uh, you get a really good idea from an agency, but they're looking to you to turn it into something, right? So they, right. they welcome new ideas. They welcome the way you're going to shoot it. Um, sometimes the idea is too long. Uh, they have lots of things they want to pack into 30 seconds, and I have to be the the guy who says, you know, that's going to be tough. Let's try to streamline it more like this. So there's a lot of uh, a creative work that goes into it from the time I get a script. Once I got a, a script that just said, Ken and Barbie are having sex. Ken has no genitals. <laughs> oh, I lost, I lost you there, but you heard, you heard that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, I heard you. I heard yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. And that, and that was all I got. And then I turned that into, I, I mean, I can send you a link to that commercial. That commercial was never shown. It, it was forbidden because <laughs> it was so wrong. Shit. <laughs> but we had two actors totally dressed up as Ken and Barbie. Wow. I know there's a, there's a Barbie movie coming out now. Maybe you should help me. Uh, That's what I was thinking him. about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is some new air into that one. But that, yes. that was, that was a very simple idea. That was just, can a bar be having genitals? Go and do it. Yeah. And sometimes you get really discreet. It depends on the agency and the clients, and they're all different. Yeah. Harold, as a kid, you know, I, I do picture you as the kid with the Super 8, you know, very much like Spielberg. I always, every, and I can't help it with directors. I always think of that they got the Super 8, they're, 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 they're living their child. You know, I just, I see that. Um, what kind of kid were you, Harold? Were you, were, you, were you somebody that was always fascinated by cinema and acting? And did you evolve yeah, into it? How, how does it work? No, I was I was that kid, and because uh, I was living in a small town outside Oslo where there was zero movie business, 
Uh, I was as far removed from anything as you could possibly be. The movie theater just every now and then had an exciting Hollywood movie, but sometimes they were just really boring European <laughs> movies too. Yeah. You know? And yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I, I just found an article because uh, I, 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 I'm you know, looking into doing some animation. I just an article. I'll send you that too, where yeah. you see me as a 12-year-old boy with all these little puppets. Uh, and it says, 12-year-old boy with five years of filmmaking experience. So I started when I was eight, basically. Wow. And, um, wow. And, yeah, and you know, and then like like everybody, Star Wars changed my life. Uh, Spielberg was like the best thing ever. I still think he is the best thing ever. And then eventually, um, after having done commercials in England, particularly where there's really smart and funny commercials, my show reel ended up on the desk of a, an agent in Paris, and the, that agent sent it to ICM here in LA. And within a couple of weeks, my wife and I had lunch with Steven Spielberg, and he invited us over, and that was that was it. Wow! Wow! And that um, happened, yes. <laughs> now, do you do you talk shop with Spielberg? Do you talk movies? Do you talk any of that kind of stuff? Does that does that go on? Well, that you know, it's not like we meet on a regular. Basically, I had the honor to meet him maybe two or three times, but that right. that lunch was was based on a project that he uh, he was uh, interested to see if I was interested in doing that. He told me my commercials were the funniest thing he had ever seen. Uh, he was uh, being very complimentary of how I was able to tell a story in thirty seconds and forty seconds. Um, and uh, but mostly I was just totally starstruck, and it was my wife doing all talking because <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't say much. And uh, and she she at that time before she became the producer in our company, she um, she was doing a criminology talk in Norway, so she was doing a private uh, or a, a thesis on private prisons. So she had a thing or two to talk to him about that because he was friends with Clinton. So she said, you know what, you should talk to Mr. Clinton about these private prisons you were having here in America. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. It's yeah. a really interesting day. Yeah, you know, and, and I've also, you know, going through your IMDb, uh, as I should, you know, I was looking at um, your affinity for Back to the Future. Is that One, is that correct? And two, if yes. it is, why, why, why do you love it so much, Harold? Well, it's uh, many reasons. It, it was the first movie I saw when I started film school in Amsterdam. Um, it was the first movie I saw there, and uh, as a stu film student in Amsterdam, you had the opportunity to, uh, it was a free ticket, every movie, and those were great spots. They showed everything. You loved lots of cinemas in Amsterdam. And I just remember walking out, uh, walking into the Back to the Future, just walking out, walking straight back in, <laughs> and saw it again, <laughs> and again and again. And, and I, think it's a, I think it's a perfect movie. You know, I've had the pleasure to meet the... Uh, Zemeckis and and I'm uh, funny enough on email basis with with Alan Silvestri, and, and it's just the, the the great thing about working in Hollywood compared to maybe Europe, where um, I'm not going to badmouth Europe, but there is a tendency to to like the the finer art of movie making, right? And um, as a guy who loved Star Wars, to sit with other fellow filmmakers in Norway uh, who were talking about Tagliani and uh, you know all these fancy Italian directors that I'd never heard of you yeah. know I just said I just love Back to the Future and they were like oh my god come on you know that's such an American movie and then when I came here and in fact my lunch with Spielberg we were discussing that and and when I met Michael Douglas and when I met you know whoever you meet Will Smith and and they ask you, what's your favorite movie? You go, well, I think Back to the Future is a perfect movie. And they look at you really seriously and they go, you know what? You're so right. That is an absolutely perfect <laughs> movie. And you meet like-minded people who then go, okay, I get it. You know, the, the, it's, it's art and commerce together with just a huge portion of entertainment. I just think it's a perfect movie. I, I, I do too. I do too, Harold. Why do you think it's a perfect movie? Do you think it's the characters? Do you think it's the cast? Do you think it's the music? I mean, I guess it's all of the above. Um, but like, what is it for you that does it? What is it for you that really grabs grabs a hold of you? It's um, it's just first of all, I just had this. It just blew my mind when I saw it in the theater. It was the most exciting, fun thing I had ever seen. It was just so wonderfully told, you know, with Zemeckis and all his blocking and the energy. But 
if you look at it from a script point of view or a storytelling point of view, it is really the perfect movie with the setup and the payoff and and uh, just the whole journey is just really, really well crafted. Uh, so I think it's I think it's as much the the script as it is the um, the movie itself. It's the yeah. perfect movie movie. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and before we get into, to, I want to just talk about a couple of your movies. But before that, you mentioned Star Wars a few times. Obviously, I love it. You love it clearly. What is it about Star Wars you love? Is there a character you love? Is there a movie you're, you have a, a specific affinity for? Well, what is it? I mean, I guess that's such an open question. I mean, we could be here for hours <laughs> talking about no, this. Yeah, and, and I'm sure a million people are like me there. But it was the thing that, that came to our theaters in Norway when I was 12 years old. My mom was very ill. Uh, she passed away shortly after. But it was that one thing of dreaming yourself away. And just that mm. that world was so complete, and it was the uh, I don't know. There's just it. We all know why that movie is so amazing, and and it was the first time you really saw something you actually believed completely, uh, and and it just transformed my. You know, I was maybe in doubt when I was eight between my I was eight and twelve. I thought maybe I should work with movies, but then I saw Star Wars. Like, okay, I'm in movies. The only way I can work with is I have to have that fix again. You know that fix that you get in the theater. Yeah. And uh, yeah. years years later, when I did my first feature in um, in uh, Sweden, actually, my first feature was not in Norway. It was in Sweden called Commander Hamilton with Peter Stormer and uh, Lena Olin. Uh, we needed an American bad guy, and I wanted Mark Hamill, and uh, I got Mark Hamill. So I'm wow, with Mark Hamill. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, uh, P Peter Stormare has been on my podcast. He's an amazing actor. Like he's yeah, he he's is fantastic. he is he is amazing. Um, you, you know, it's it's amazing how you bring up an escape. I never thought of it that way, but but it is, isn't it? Like it is the ultimate escape, and it being so authentic and real, it just provides like more authenticity to that. I just oh, I, I agree with you, Harold. Yeah, it's uh, from the opening credits till the end. It's just uh, you're gone, you know, and that's the, it's the suspension of disbelief. It's what we're all hoping for when we make movies. Yeah, the and, and uh, gold. And I wanted to talk about two years. I wanted to start with a very, very, very underrated movie called The Twelfth Man. Um, my goodness, why do you feel like if a bigger studio got and, and there's nothing wrong with IFC, there's nothing wrong with any of that. Like, do you think if a bigger studio got a hold of it? It would have been because I feel like if I could make 500 people watch this movie, like I've done my job, like it is so well done. It, 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 it you throw the true story in there, you throw the idea that I, I don't know, it, it's it, it's it's a it holds up a mirror to humanity towards the human emotion. My God, Harold, I mean, and this is before you and I were communicating. Like these are the two movies I wanted to focus on, Karate Kid later on, but this is a very very underrated movie. And being history buff. My dad passed, and I know if he was with us, this is a movie he would absolutely, absolutely love. Yeah, thank you for saying that. I mean, it's uh, uh, underrated in the sense that it never got the attention it deserved. You know, it, it did get a lot of, uh, it had the uh, stellar reviews on NPR and all the big outlets. It was just, it, it kind of missed, um, it missed the window of uh, best foreign picture because I think uh, Norway that year submitted another movie because you know it's the countries that submit their respectable their respectable movies, and uh, Twelfth Man being sold to uh, UFC Midnight was I never understood that it was the Nordisk film uh, that had a deal with them and I guess they jumped on the the offer, um, but I agree. A bigger studio and a bigger outlet would have helped. It's it's on iTunes and Amazon. It was on Netflix for a little while, and then the World War Two movies kept coming in. You know, so yeah. I was I'm the two guy now. Um, but I I agree. I wish that movie had a um, you know if it at least had been in the best foreign picture run, it would have been seen by more people. But I'm glad people discover it, and I'm hoping maybe you can help me make people more people discover it it was a um, it was a an honor to make it it was a movie that needed to be made because our our younger generation are slowly forgetting what our forefathers had to go through for us to live in the you know in the freedom that we live in today and um it was also an untold story well it's not untold it's been told before but it was an yeah. undertold story when it came to what people way up in north of Norway went through during the war. Um, 
So, and also these men, what they sacrificed uh, to in their attempt, you know, it was a very complicated thing, the whole thing, because north of Norway at that point was the stronghold of the German. It was the northern border for the Third Reich. And not a lot of people know this, but in Tromsø, in north of Norway, that was sort of the the northern border for against Russia and and the Allied forces. So that's where Hitler had his other his biggest ship, all his air force. They were all up there, and they were bombing all these Allied forces that were feeding the the Russians through the North Passage. And uh, eventually, all the subs and all the airplanes managed to stop that those convoys. And it was Jan Bolzer and his friends' uh, mission to reopen that convoy. And they, they failed. But it, he, he, in his escape, turned that journey into, you know, you see in the movie, too, how the resistance, you know, stays alive because they want to keep him alive. It ended up being something bigger than him. Um, yeah. And it was a, it was a real uh, super challenging movie to make because it was so, so cold. And our equipment froze, and poor Thomas, who's who's not an actor, by the way, he is a he's a rapper. Who I I couldn't believe, that, I could not believe, I could not believe that this was his first. I could not believe that this is his first movie. I couldn't. I had to look that up. I could not believe that. Could not. Yeah, believe he's it. a he's a very natural talent. I've used him in a Oof. TV show too. He's a, he's a fantastic, fantastic guy. Um, and uh, uh, you know, we went through a lot uh, making that movie. And Jonathan Rhys Myers, who didn't speak a word of German before the movie. He learned that very, very quickly. And people think he's half German. So that was a, a challenging movie, but very, very satisfying to make. Uh, it's a little bit, it reminded me a little bit, uh, essentially of, of, of a little bit of William Wallace and Braveheart, right? It becomes the legend, the, the fighting force, the spirit, right? Because that's kind yeah. of, I mean, different types of characters, but like the, the same principle, I think. And I, I think that really adds to this, Harold. Yeah, it's a, it is sort of the purpose of making a movie is to is to somehow make you believe when you're sitting in the dark theater and, and even if you're a skeptic or you don't believe in any, like I don't really believe in much, but I, I do like to think there are things that are bigger than ourselves. And, mm. and, and when, you're, when you're in the movie theater, you can kind of hypnotize the audience to believe that for a second. So when the, when the, when the indigenous people, you know, the, the reindeer at the end, when they told me they have, for them, the white reindeer is a holy animal. But the, the best part about it was that the reindeer, when it's pulling somebody, it will go back to the person it was pulling because it has a job to do. And it will go back to the person who fed him. So that all is believable, the, the, the surprise at the end there, so to speak. Um, but that sort of elevated because I, I need something and, and you know we had to so, come up with some of that but i needed something where every human being along the way has helped him and there are no humans left so that's when sort of the divine forces the the nature comes in and pulls him the last uh, meters across the border you know and and that kind of made it even bigger than life itself which i was very happy with yeah, that's well said. You know, it, it yeah, his journey is I mean, it's tough to watch. And I don't mean tough like the movie's not good. Tough like my god, you feel for him and you feel for others in this movie. It's it, it, and again, like I I'm wondering like there's I've seen World War II movies that are just it looks like they just mailed it in. Like nobody cared. Like, it was just like let's just do something uh, let's do a period piece. This is like you could tell the time you put into this. It's so well crafted. You could tell that this was personal and passionate for you, Harold. Yeah, thank you. It was because the the guy who wrote the book, uh, he was the nephew of, or he is, he's the nephew of, of uh, Jan Bolsru. It was very important for him to tell the, the, the real story because the, the indigenous people, they hadn't been represented properly in this story. And a lot of the people along the way hadn't just, their story hadn't been told properly. So we just set out to really set the record straight and, and be as, as authentic as we possibly could. Um, there's not a lot written about him, so there are holes in the story. We had to come up with things like, like uh, Stage, the, the German guy who we did find out in the archives in Germany that he did report that he had taken all 12, even though he knew he only had taken 11. Right. And, and that's when I thought, oh, that's the, that's the motivation, because if he gets caught having lied in his report, that's going to drive him. And, and that felt like a really good engine. And then my 
my wife and producer came up with the idea that he should swim in the water to sort of challenge see that, that he was tougher than Jan Balser himself. And and I remember shooting that scene. The the water is literally less than it's it's super cold up there. Oof. You know, and, and Jonathan was he said, Okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. But I gotta do it now. He had motivated himself, and then we just okay, let's shoot. And and it's one take. He walks in there and he sits as long. I just left him in there as long as he could possibly take it. And then he couldn't take it anymore and he walks out of there. So it's all authentic, you know. Yeah. And it was funny because yeah. we had a we had a wood burning hot tub right outside up on the on the uh, on the shore, and then you saw these these uh, prisoners, you know, Russian prisoners sitting next to this <laughs> German Nazi in the hot tub. Yeah. There were really surreal images <laughs> behind the camera there. Yeah, and the book is called "Those Who Saved Him," correct, Harold? Yeah, uh, it's called uh, um, uh, "Defined Courage," is what it's called in in the states. Okay. Uh, it's not nine lives. It's it's the the, the new movie is uh, new book is Defiant Courage, uh, and the the writer is uh, uh, Tore Haug. Yeah, Tore Haug. Defiant Courage is if you look up Defiant Courage, you'll see the book. Yeah, and you know it it's it's unbelievable because when you look at uh, historical movies and, and and the Nazis over time, it's amazing how fluky luck they have, right? So like in, in this movie, they they're getting ready. They, they want to just tear apart this runway. Obviously, things go south. Uh, Valkyrie, Tom Cruise wants to, you know, I mean, these are based on, you know, things go south. And then when you see, you hear about all these Nazi prison guards, they all live to be like a hundred. Like, I don't know. It's just like, it's just like yeah. this fluke, this like fluky luck. And it's like, I don't know. You, you think that karma would have played a bigger part than it has on some of these. People. Yeah. Yeah. I think, well, Staga, you know, he was, when he walks out into the water in the end there, he knew his. His time had come, so they did catch yeah. him eventually, and he was, you know, killed for for war crimes, basically. But so luck wasn't great with him, but he certainly deserved what what was coming to him. Yeah, and I rewatched it again knowing we were going to speak, and I really love the tagline: "The most incredible events in this story are the ones that actually took place." I think that's such a powerful. I think it's a great tagline, Harold. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, I mean it's it's actually worse than what we did because he did cut more toes. Wow. You know, wow. he had one toe left when he uh, when he crossed the border, and he was even thinner than what he was. And you know, Thomas had he lost I think twenty five kilos for the part. Wow! And he had and he had to do it twice because we had to shoot the reindeer a year before we shot all the others because you know they were moving the reindeer, and they said you have to shoot him now. They're going to be on the mountains just another couple of weeks. So we rushed up to the mountain, and we shot that thousand that and that's all real there's no cg reindeer that's a thousand reindeers uh, wow. running across there uh, harold yeah. what was the total shoot what was the total shoot time on this uh god i can't remember i think we had some 45 days or something it, it was really i had uh, two big scenes every day it was uh, not a big budget and uh my producer Veshlemey and uh, her, her partner producer espen horn uh, should be mentioned for actually pulling it really off uh, on this movie for making the money go really far, and of course I had the best DP. You know, I had the best. I was so happy with the crew; they're just amazing. Yeah, and if, if whoever's listening, watching wherever you watch your podcast, this movie, The Twelfth Man, I'm telling you, as far as movies go, it's a hidden gem, and 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 I, I would I, I wouldn't stand behind it if I didn't believe in it. It is a very 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 good movie, and. Again, when people watch it, they're going to be like, "How did I miss this? How did I miss this?" Like, I guarantee it. So, yeah. Harold, very well Thank done you. on that. On that, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted you. to end. I, I wanted to end the interview talking about the Karate Kid, another very underrated, wonderful movie that I think has. I think this movie is a lot more powerful than people give it credit for. I think there's. I think this movie has more international love than in the states love. I think a lot of people in the states still love it, but I feel like this movie has created something special. I feel like it ignited the spark. I feel like. It works hand in hand with the original. They're different movies. I get that. They're different. But the what they've done, their purpose of influencing people is the same. And I really love these. Um, how did you come into this project, Harold? Because it truly is a wonderful, wonderful movie. Well, it was a uh it was a, a movie that was floating around and they were looking for a director. Jaden was already on board. I think Jackie was gonna be on board and um I was pitching for it. You know, that's what you do as a director. You have to go in and you have to fight for the for the job. 
Uh, and there were a lot of directors interested because uh, it's of, obviously an amazingly attractive title and an amazingly attractive team. You know, the, uh, the, uh, Will Smith and his people are, and Jada, they're fantastic people. Um, and it was, uh, I w went in and, 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 and it's like uh, when you pitch, you first you meet the, the one guy, then you meet the next guy, you climb up, you know, and then that same guy is always along. So you sometimes always have to make sure your meetings is fresh. You always bring something new. Yeah. And then it was, I think it was down to me and one more guy uh, who I also think, I didn't know who it was, but I knew that he was a guy who had done a lot of sports movies. And I never considered this to be a sports movie. This was not a sports movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, but he had done those, you know, American sports movies where they win in the end and goosebumps and everything. And my wife and I were sitting, how we're going to kick, you know, the door open on this one. And then we decided to build a model. We built a small scale model. I can send you a picture of that too. A scale yeah. model of, of Jackie Chan's hutong, you know, the Chinese, the, the heart of the movie, so to speak. And we built that. Uh, spent two nights building it. Uh, we had to do it after kids went to bed because they wanted to play with it. <laughs> and then I remember I was going to go in and meet Amy Pascal, who is, who is a really cool woman, you know, and she loves filmmaking. She loves anything tangible. So uh, I thought this is, go this is going to help me at least. So I, and then I was waiting outside her office over at the Sony lot. And then I heard, you know, the time passed. She's, her meeting was running late. And I was like, oh, God, my, they're reading t into my time. And then eventually, you know, yeah, you have 15 minutes. <sighs> you know, and I walk in with his model. It's, it's really big. You know, I have to carry it like this. I'll show you pictures. And then I open the door. And I, I, with my elbow, I turned the lights off in her office. And I, because I turned the lights on on the model. Because, you know, the car with the one headlight and everything was already set up. That's how I came up with the shadow theater was because of this model. Yeah. And I put that in front of her, and she was like, she picked up the phone and said, cancel my next meeting. <laughs> and it was just, it was just amazing. It was one of those Hollywood moments. And, 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 you know, and I could talk her through the whole movie and how everything worked and that it's centered around this slightly magical place. And, and, and then after that, you go and meet uh, Will Smith, you know. And, and I, think I, was actually, I think I was actually flying back to Norway for a commercial. Uh, so I went on the plane. I landed in Paris. I heard, no, Will Smith wants to meet you. I literally went on a plane and flew back again. Mm. <laughs> and I picked up the model here at the house, drove up to his house. And, you know, so it's a, it's a long journey if you really want something. It's uh, the pitching process is a long journey for, for directors. So you have to go through it. Yeah, it, it seems like a frustrate. It can be a frustrating one at times, too, you know. Yeah, not not in this case, but in other cases, you know. Um, what did you what did you like about the original Harold, the original Karate Kid? Well, funny enough, the the original Karate Kid was not. You know, uh, I might be a little wrong here, but it was it wasn't as massive as it was here back in Norway. Right for us, it was a it was another fun American movie. Well, Ralph Maggio, uh, we remember his pose. You know. With, to us, that was a little American, all that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I kind of liked it, so I never really realized what of a national treasure the movie actually was. Um, but of course, the, this new take on it with with uh, uh, him and his mom going to China. I was really interested in China. I think it's a fascinating place. That whole thing, uh, and I've always loved kung fu and martial arts, though I don't knew, do any of it myself. I always loved it in movies. So that and the emotional journey I thought was just so wonderful. And I remember I sat down with, uh, you know, we, had, we were lucky to have James Horner be a composer. On oh, it. he's fantastic. Oh, yes. Oh, um, yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. We lost him, uh, yes. but he was amazing. And uh, I remember the first time we met, he said, so, you know, it's a kid's movie. How do, how, do you, how do you want this? I said, no, it's not a kid's movie. Do not look at it as a kid's movie. Nobody on the movie it's because when you're a kid and you're fighting in a in a park, the, that fight is as mean and vicious as it is for grown-ups. So there's nothing kiddy about the movie. So we all took it really seriously, including James. And, and that kind of, I think, gave the movie also the broader audience that it needed. So grown-ups and kids and everybody liked it just as much. Yeah, when, when Mr. Um, Han is explaining to uh, Dre how he lost his family, and that scene unfolds. 
Horner's music, and then obviously we evolved to the shadow, the, you know, the shadow. The, like his music just drives that scene. I mean, the acting drives it too, but James Horner's music is is pretty damn special, Harold, and that's and, and the whole movie, but especially in that scene. Yeah, and 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 again, that was that was one of the hardest cues to hit, and and that's when you know you work with a great composer is when you're yeah. sitting there and you go, you know what? I'm not crying yet. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's what you've written is great. I think we had maybe eight or ten attempts at that piece, and every time he was okay, well, come back tomorrow. I'll have something new, and you know, and Will and I went in and we we're just sitting there listening, and suddenly the tears start coming, and then you go, okay. There it is. Yeah, I remember yeah. the, with the the fascinating thing with James Horner was that you know he <clears throat> a lot of composers work with samples and computers and everything. So when you go in and you listen to their score, it's almost almost finished, right? It's and sometimes it doesn't really work, even though it's so finished. And you go, well, is this is not working. And then they go, well, let me remove the drums. And you go, that still doesn't really work. <laughs> but for James. He was just by his grand piano, and he said, "Here's the theme," and I was like, "Oh, I feel something immediately." Even though it was just piano, yeah. And and so, so it was all about the music. And then he said, "Well, we'll add all the fun stuff later, but you just have to love the theme." So he was really a puritan in that sense. Yeah, it, it really is a wonderful score. Um, and I have to say, Roger Pratt's cinematography is fabulous as well. Underrated, yep. underrated. A lot of those scenes, those dropbacks, beautiful stuff. You know, it's just. I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot good going on here. Harold, do you feel that somebody who is a director has to have somewhat of has to be somewhat of a cinematographer, right? You have to, as a director, don't you have to have some kind of idea <clears throat> of how you want things to look, what you want them to look like? I always feel like directors have to at least be a little bit of a cinematographer. Is that is that a good way of looking at that, Harold? Yeah, it's uh, it's funny as you know. Now I work with Gear, who is my favorite cinematographer, who shot the Twelfth Man, and yeah, and we have a we have a really good shorthand. But it's it's you work with images and you work with mood, and it's thing with composer. How do you tell a composer what the music should be? You can't really say, well, here I want it to be major and three quarter, you know, beat. Or you can't do that. You have to just communicate the mood. So. Uh, you say you can say stuff like you know I want long lenses, but the intention of a long lens is because you want to isolate the person from the background. You want it to be more out of focus, you know. So you have to somehow communicate the emotion that they want to get, and then the craftsman, the composer, or the production designer, or the you know the wardrobe designer, they all have to interpret your vision. But you can't go around and say, "Hey, I want to have a lens like this. I want it to be like put the light there." You can't do that because then. First of all, I'm not a, I wouldn't be able to do it. I don't know how they get the magic. So I just tell gear, should be like this. I walk away, work with the actors, and I come back and I go, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and you work with a couple of fabulous actors, one of which is Jackie Chan. I personally think he's so underrated. I mean, he's very popular. I get that. But what's it like Jackie Chan being in China? I feel like that's like Elvis at Graceland. Like, I can't even imagine... <laughs> The popular, like you had, there's a great story you said in another interview where, I think it was an interview where you said, you guys had a very minimal crew in some of your shooting, right? You you even had Will Smith carrying things at a certain point. Yeah. Um, I guess I guess it's two questions. One of which is, how how popular is Jack? Is, is it a real thing? Is he like a really, I mean, is what is it his popularity like in China? And, and did that pre prevent any type of obstacle for you as a director? Yeah, he's massive. Yeah. He's the biggest star there, and uh, yeah. and we shot a scene uh, where he was carrying the sleeping Jaden through the hutongs in Beijing, and uh, and it was one of those things where Will and I and the production we agreed let's just jump in a van. We just need a little monitor. Let's not bring all the circus. Um, and we just were standing behind the van, you know, Will with a baseball hat and the hoodie, just covering himself up, and then they, we just smuggled Jackie in the back. And then he walked through with Jaden sleeping over his shoulder. And we had one perfect take, but then it was done. You know, by then people were in mad, madness, Beatlemania. So we had to get out of there very quickly. Yeah. But the, yeah. But the carrying lenses thing was, it was very really interesting because we, we were shooting up at this, uh, the highest peak in the Wudong Mountains on that temple. And, and it was one of those little tiny gondolas, scary gondolas. Mm. You just have two people at a time, so we didn't have much time. And, and you have to constantly look at the weather because it changes all the time. 
So we're like, oh, it's, it's going to be nice up there now. Let's run up. So we took the gondola, and we just basically had camera lenses, the sound guy, Will, Jackie, Jaden, myself, uh, Roger. And, and then Jackie had the spray in his back pocket so he could spray them so they were sweaty, put it back in his back pocket. Will was carrying lenses. <laughs> you know, it, was, <laughs> it was like real filmmaking. And, and they loved it too. You know, they, they just, both of them are real filmmakers at heart. So it was a real inspiring for them, I think. It, yeah, yeah, I have to believe so too because it reflects in the movie making. It, 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 was, a, it was Jackie's idea for the jacket on, jacket off. You know, it was, it was, we were looking for that one thing that we had to, repl we knew we had to replace the, the uh, paint, paint the fence thing. Yeah, and I yeah. went to China and I went to China and I met, I met Jackie and I said, so what is Kung Fu? You know, how do, where do we start? And he was like, you know, everything is basically Kung Fu. And then I told Will that and he said, well, that's a line in the movie. And it is, you know, everything is Kung Fu. Yeah. And then, and then he said, you know, I can just take my jacket off and I can take my jacket on. That is Kung Fu. And that's when we thought, oh my God, maybe that's the thing. You know, he pretends he's trying to teach him a lesson and then bury it inside. All those moves are all the basic moves on the first fight of the, uh, the Kung Fu. So it sort of happened a little bit uh, spontaneous uh, from Jackie saying, well, I can just take my jacket on, jacket off. And we're like, wow, that's, there it is. There's a solution. Yeah. yeah. How much of Jackie's input was taken into stunts? Uh, I know he, has, he had a little bit of a team with him. How much of that was taken in? No, that was his guys doing all that. You know, gotcha, the, the, gotcha. yeah, the, and those are fantastic. They're, you know, I've never seen anything like that. The thing we had to work on a little bit was was a bit of the storytelling because I said, you know, when because a lot of their choreography don't really take into account that people actually get hit in the face. Right. So you know, they were they were hit and then they boom 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 boom. And I said, you know, we should actually cut a little hole in it and open it up and make a little pause. So when people are hit in the face, they got to go down. They come up again. They breathe. You know, we got to see that all these hits actually have an impact. Right. And and right. that's how we work together. Because otherwise, it just becomes a sort of a ballet of moves. They need to needed to feel real. Yeah, and and I feel like Jaden does a great job in this movie. Oh, yeah, I got, no, I got you. Are you there? Yes, there? I'm here. Sorry, yeah. what did you yeah, say? Okay, no, don't worry. I'll, yeah. I'll edit it together. Um, so, so I feel like Jaden really busted his ass on this too to get everything right. Whether it's learning a language or the physicality of it, I really feel like he did an underrated, wonderful job in this movie. Yeah, he was amazing. I mean, uh, the, that whole family is just so dedicated to what they do. They are super friendly and respectful. It was every day on the set. Uh, Will and Jada came and pepped everybody up and. Uh, you know, they were just so supportive of the whole process, basically. And and uh, whenever there was something I wanted to try out, Will said, well, we're not coming back, so you better try it now. <laughs> you know, so it was really, really a wonderful process. But but Jaden, like you said, he had to learn Chinese. He had to constantly learn these moves in, in uh, Kung Fu. He had to learn just the lines of the movie. It was 40 degrees Celsius hot. It was, I mean, I've never seen a kid work that hard and still be always pleasant and always so sweet. So. Yes, I think he was just really amazing and and so friendly too, yeah. which is a gift. Yeah, you know who else is very underrated is the actor who plays Chang. He does stunts now, but my God, that kid did a great job in this movie. Like so underrated. People talk, you know, he's the Johnny Lawrence or whatever you want to compare him to in this movie, but a very different character. But <laughs> wonderful job. And how much of a challenge is it, Harold, to? get kids that can act but also fight and all that and, and do those stunts how much of a challenge is, is that i mean it's in, in instances like that you have to look look at for naturals right like with thomas in the 12th man if, if people have it they have it you don't have yeah. to teach them how to act uh, you just have to make sure that you you surround them with the right situation they need to understand why they're doing why they're doing what they're doing and then it comes from inside and and uh, he was a kid that was picked out of, we were down to, I think, 10 really elite fighters. And we we're just watching them. And you could just see the intensity in his face. He, he just stood out amongst them all. Um, and the girl is really interesting, too, because she, we were looking high and low for, we needed a girl who could play the violin and who could speak English. And, and the funny thing is, if, if that's your casting brief in China, you know, you get girls who are, fantastic violin players and they speak perfectly English. And, and, and we had all these great 
young girls come in and do all these things and and none of them felt like they were from another part of the world you know because he's from america she's from china it really needs to feel like they're from two different worlds basically and then they meet and then there was this one girl that came in and she was not even from beijing she was from out of town she was a farm girl and she was a little wacky but she didn't speak one word of english and she didn't she'd never <laughs> touched a violin but you know there was something about her and i remember i was over in china alone then and i said my god she's fantastic there was just a, a pain and a focus yeah and and I brought her, I brought it back to Will and I said, I think this is the girl. And he said, but she doesn't speak English or she plays the violin. And I said, but I know I, I, we can work it out. She can just look. So she learned all her lines phonetically. She has no idea what she's saying. She just learned the lines phonetically. Wow. And, wow. and then, and then when she played the violin, I said, I need her to play one bar of Chopin. And we put her with a teacher and she, she worked a month just to, you know, own the violin is a very, you can very quickly see if people can't play because my father played the violin and then i said i just needed to play the first bar and then she played this so i have one wide shot and then for the other shots i used two other girls so she was just standing with the violin and then i had one girl on the on the ground sticking her left hand up and i had another girl doing the right hand so when you see the close-ups of her playing the violin there are three girls together they're just below frame so that's how i solved that and i don't think anybody ever knew that she never never played the violin <laughs> that's incredible harold wow um i have two last questions for you thank you for all this time you are such a good man thank you for this um i i, I read where will smith asked ralph macho to be a part of this project had he accepted was there a w w as director would you have found a place for him in this do you think there was a place for him in this had he accepted uh, you know that never really came to me uh, right. I know maybe Will and him had uh, had a debate about it. I think they floated the idea at one point. We we never were looking for anything uh, to break the fourth wall or be self-referential. The only thing we had fun with was when, you know, with the chopsticks, and then we said, why don't we put a twist on it? And then he used the fly swatter instead just to somehow yeah. tell the audience that we know, you know, this is a remake, but here's a new version of it. I don't think, you know, we could have found a place for it, and it might have been one of those little... Easter eggs, but I think it was a wise decision just to keep the movie clean yeah. up of references like that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, and I mentioned to you at the beginning. I really feel like Cobra Kai's popularity in this country is a bit is is a huge part of what this movie has done. I really believe your movie boosted that. And I think I've had some of the cast from Cobra Kai on, and, and they mentioned this movie a lot. Like this. Is oh, the they one. do. <laughs> yes, this is oh. the one that they met. I'm always expecting. Okay, 1984 Karate Kid. They do mention it. But this one comes up just as much. Um, oh, good. So looking back at you at this movie, how do you see it, Harold? How, uh, you must be super proud of this movie. It's it, you know, it's a movie that I can't wait to show my daughter when she gets old enough. Like I just, I really, I, I love. I'm in love with this movie. I think it's a great movie. Thank you. Now it's it's funny. It's just, you know when when you when you work so much on a movie, um, I I never really sit and watch them again. You know, I, I enjoy seeing them with an audience uh, every once in a while. Uh, you know, we just recently made a very funny comedy in Norway called Long Flat Balls, which which was a huge hit. I enjoyed every time watching it. It's been, it's been on festivals here in the States and, and just watching it in front of an American audience. It's funny to see the audience reaction, but I would never I would never sit down in my own house and watch one of my own movies. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. think I could do that. Yeah, but I, I, I'm very proud of it. I really I really like it. And I have so many young people telling me it's their favorite movie and, you know and that makes me proud yeah it's terrific uh what's around the corner for you harold any projects you want to get out there you know what what are you up to are you whatever you wanted to throw out there i'll, I'll, I'll let you have the floor right well we're we're uh, we have a lot of our own after the 12th man it was so inspiring to do our own projects so we have a animation movie about viking girls we have a, a musical in the works uh we have a an action movie uh, uh, that I can't talk too much, but yeah, we got a lot cooking, and um, uh, and there's a couple of World War II movies that I'm really interested in. Uh, so right now we're um, we're just basically seeing what comes in first. Yeah, I'm a big fan of your work, Harold, and I, and I got to tell thank you, you. I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast today. You're a good guy, and, and and thank you for all this time. It's really valuable and treasured. Thank you so much, and thank you for the the words of Twelfth Man. If you can spread the word about that movie, it'd be great. Thank you. Oh, I.